Hey everybody and welcome back to the channel. Hope you all are doing well and we are back with some Spellslingers content. Uh, after I put up all of those tournament videos, it took a little bit of a break and we had a bit of a change of pace, but we're back especially because a lot of folks had answered that poll that I sent out on the YouTube channel of whether it was like specific planeswalkers or wanting to see aggro versus control. Um, and I think we had pretty much dead even votes for uh, videos on aggro and control over mid range. Um, and I sort of, I put like the planeswalkers as an example. Um, so what I'd like to do in at least the video series that I'm starting for today and, and probably will be building on in the future is really, uh, reintroducing some uh, different deck builds and concepts for players that have probably played with them and tweaked them. Um, and so I think it'll it'll still give a little bit uh, of information there for people who maybe just have played against a lot of a specific aggro planeswalker, but uh, just haven't had as much experience building it or kind of figuring out what types of strategies like just seem to have the highest win percent. Um, so today we're going to be doing aggro. And I'm going to go over three planeswalkers. Uh, my what I would say are have have been the top two aggro planeswalkers for quite a long time um, since we got the addition of Garrick and Davriel, and um, have not had any specific updates uh, since then. So um, we're going to start with Nahiri, and we're going to go over Chandra. We're also going to go over um, I think Angrath. And although I think like Davriel has an aggro build, and there's Gideon, and there are a couple more, I think. Uh, the question I want to answer today is like whether you're new or an old player if you're saying I want to play the best aggro deck and I want to have potential different builds um, how would I build it that's kind of the question that we're we're answering today so we'll go over two builds for each planeswalker um, I'm going to try and keep my eye on the time so we don't go too long uh, but uh, as always I appreciate your likes your comments and subscribes um, feel free to let me know if you guys would like specific Spellslingers content. Um, I've definitely been playing a little bit less, but uh, for the most part, I'm still really, really excited for the Mythic League Tournament number four, which we will have coming up. All you have to do to qualify. And thank you, Wushu, for the shout out in your video. Uh, I think it was uh, this week or recently. Um, you just hit Mythic. Join the Discord for the MTG official uh, local game store, the LGS, um, and you just post like a screenshot, just something that shows us that you're in Mythic, that allows you to sign up. So the reset, uh, oh yeah, for those who didn't see, there's going to be the league reset on the 29th of the month. So if you're trying to hit top 100 or have any other specific goals, try and do it before then, um, because it's pretty unreliable when they actually take the top 100 snapshots. So just keep that in mind. Um, and so there's a season reset, but we're going to be opening up registration likely starting uh, Wednesday uh, the 26th, which is coming up. I'm recording this on Sunday, so just a couple days away. Um, and we'd love to have a bunch of players. Uh, the only things you need to know is if you've entered before, you can't use the Planeswalker that you used last tournament. That's just to keep things a little bit fresher and mix it up. Um, and you'll also have a sideboard. We found that to be like a really great format. Uh, and for those who aren't familiar, um, I'll probably just do a little promo video for it anyway, just so that folks know. But a sideboard is going to be six cards that you have access to, to swap for six cards in your main deck in games two and three, because it's a best of three for the matches to uh, to get to the finals in Mythic League, uh, in the Mythic League tournament. So um, it, it really gives you a chance to shore up some of the weaknesses that aggro might have, right? Maybe you have more mid-range tools. Maybe you've got better aggressive tools against control decks. Um, for those of you who play Magic the Gathering, it's a concept that you're probably a little bit familiar with. So um, get ready for the Mythic League Tournament 4. It's coming up. We would love to see some new faces and new folks. Um, and I always get pretty excited for it when it comes up because there's always a bit of a buzz uh, to really compete um with all the mythic league players so uh without further ado though thank you for sticking with me <laughs> my very long intro let's get into what i've felt for a while is the best aggressive planeswalker nahiri um and we're gonna go over two builds for each planeswalker like i said because i do think that there are certain choices that can be made that can either freshen up the deck or just give it a little bit more game 
against certain matchups. But I, I got to always shout out the folks who have worked on these decks. Mon Man, who had first like really poured a lot of time and energy into this specific build of Nahiri when Path of Barbarian got uh, buffed back in the day. Um, all these came down uh, a, mana, a mana cost. So this was two, this was three, this was five. They all got shortened, um, you know, shrunk down rather. And uh, that really enabled the deck to have a really, really interesting strategy alongside Ember Spawn Crags where you're getting these kind of free bodies that have a higher power. You've got your passive ability for Nahiri, which gives something plus two plus O, oh, right? The Stoneforge Blade. And so it's really easy to hit Indomitable Strength, which says whenever you attack, it deals five, it lava axes their face, does five damage to their face. So basically, I think what Mon Man had worked on here is just uh, how do we have haste threats that come in and do a lot of damage? How do we make sure our power is is easily hitting five so that it works with Path of the Barbarian? Um, what removal do we need? Uh, how do we just keep pressuring our opponent? So I won't go through all the cards, but the key concepts really are that any card that has three power in this deck can become five power to proc the indomitable strength with your Stoneforge blade, right? So Elite Vanguard, that's a decision to play that card. Pouncing Lemur, same thing. Overgrown Iguana, Sword Cannoneer, uh, Blitzing Minotaur, Sky Knight Legionnaire, Will Smith, who actually pumps it so that all two power creatures can carry the sword to be plus three plus so and attack for five um, and then of course zozu as well can can do the same thing and i would say one of the sweetest pieces of tech in this deck that was added was decorative armor um and i had seen this in oddly enough a kiora build which was really interesting at the time um and it just fits perfectly into what you're doing here because you're basically treating every creature that you draw as a way to close out the game by dealing direct damage to their face. And what Decorative Armor does is just make three, essentially free 3-3s, three right? You pay four mana up front to get a 3-3 three three that turn, which can carry a sword and hit them for five. Um, and yes, it's fleeting, so it'll die at the end of turn. But then the next two turns, you just get to do that for no mana, right? So it's just a really great way of getting card advantage for exactly what you want to do when you're setting up your indomitable strength so um there are some you know card choices i think you can change around this deck i think some standout cards are obviously two-headed hellhound whether it's carrying a sword or whether it's it's buffed even just by the uh mindless mindless rage uh this thing is just hitting for a lot um and often hellhound becomes like a real threat for one mana burn through just enables you to keep pushing through damage right you don't really care about necessarily killing a creature you just want to be able to attack through it you've got a lot of haste threats uh you don't have a ton of interaction because path of the barbarian spots you a removal spell with mindless rage and you can set it up well right i mean even though it's random it does the most da damage based on the strongest creature so if you just keep trading and keep things kind of off the board right you're going to be able to get a mindless rage that's really really impactful and then I chose, I don't know that Mon Man chose this, but I chose to keep one Nahiri's Outburst. I think having access to two like kind of hard removal spells is still, still seems fine. But I will say, if you haven't played Nahiri, I'm going to tell you right now, when you don't draw a haste creature, when you don't draw an evasive creature off the top of your library, it feels really bad. And what I mean by that is you just get so, so much out of your creatures in this deck and it's your best way of pressuring your opponent that you really can't afford to kind of dirtle around, um, you know, and just like waffle around and not really do much when you, you're waiting to use your like Nahiri's Outburst at the right time. So you do want to be really careful of making sure you're curving out. It's like a creature each turn, if not more so, right? And then setting up your path of the Barbarian to close things out with Indomitable Strength. So that is pretty much the core of the deck. And whatever Ember Spawn crags is procking it's just giving you even more and more ways of closing out the deck um and although there's some different choices you could run tajik in this deck you could run a couple other things i've been generally pretty happy with inferno at the top of the curve and zozu and decorative armor um i don't really want to go towards five or six i think there's just 
plenty to do with your mana because every single turn you have the option to pay one mana to give a sword to a creature right um and sometimes fledgling griff is so excellent in the early game because it's an evasive threat and it can peck in for three damage with the sword um and then iguana can just trade with trade up on something usually um and you know get some trample damage in goblin short cutter just excellent for pushing damage through um and you just have a lot of haste threats minotaur legionnaire core recruit raging goblin inferno zozu i mean haste is just a really really important piece and honestly sky knight legionnaire is probably one of the best draws you can have in the late game because you're going to smack for at least four in the air with legionnaire plus sword um and then it's easy to still get it up to five whether that's through uh willful smith the first time or if you've got the mindless rage which is the artifact axe which is the first part of path of the barbarian and it just a lot of times you're hitting for 10 because they don't have a flying creature and so you hit them for five in the air and then you lava axe them with indomitable strength so um the deck has a lot of power it does have to you have to sequence it correctly um and you can replace certain cards here and there but i've just really been happy with this kind of build for quite a while however the reason we're going to look at a second build is because i think this build is in my mind like more aggressively tuned but you can also have Nahiri be a little bit more mid-range that doesn't run out of gas that doesn't necessarily re revolve around path of the barbarian although i think she's probably one of the best planeswalkers if not the best planeswalker to utilize it um, and that's why I do want to show you uh, what I had nicknamed Nona, question mark. Uh, for those of you who hadn't played against Nona, um, this was a player who was tearing up the leaderboard. Um, I think pretty much almost always queuing uh, Nahiri. But the main difference, which is a big difference, is they were playing Moreland Haunt. Now, Moreland Haunt definitely operates a lot differently than the Ember Spawn Crags. Um, this is proccing on turn six earliest instead of turn five and it's giving you a one one copy of a random creature now i will say nahiri has a lot of creatures that have debut triggers right so uh you do have you have cannoneer you've got short cutter uh recruit comes back with an armor on it you've got uh mystic if you're playing it um you've got will smith if you're playing it so you know you get like a little bit of value but the main thing right which obviously you'll, you'll probably even know before i say it is that you're going to get a flying threat right it's although it's a one one uh but in the case of zozu that doesn't work because zozu just gets buffed after attack so it's not a one one it's gonna smack them pretty hard um you just put a sword on it right you just use your stoneforge blade give it plus two plus oh and and this kind of build which i sort of nicknamed the nona build for myself when i was kind of reverse building from when i had played against him a couple times uh it just has more longevity uh, because you're getting evasive threat, you're trading in your land slot, getting more of these plus two plus oh fleeting cards, you're trading it to get evasive threats that have flying that can carry a sword and potentially stick around. Um, it's a different play style. And so I generally have felt like this build can be really good when you're playing constantly into like mid range, for instance, right? Because generally how the sort of rock paper scissors of magic the gathering sort of like uh meta works is that aggro can beat control right because aggro gets underneath control but aggro gets beaten by mid-range because mid-range goes taller or bigger to deal with what aggro is doing at the cheap rate and then control beats mid-range because control goes over the top of mid-range so when i think you're in a meta and like i think although things may be changing on the ladder. Like if you just find that you're running into a lot of Garrick, um, a lot of potentially even Drist. Um, there's a mid range version that I like to play of Davriel. Um, you know, who I, I think Cura falls into the mid range category. Uh, there's actually quite a, quite a few planeswalkers that do. Um, you might just prefer to have an evasive threat that sticks around rather than going kind of all in on the path of barbarian strategy. So um, I did want to talk about this build because I don't want to pretend that there aren't ways to iterate on these builds because there really are. Uh, I think the Mythic League tournaments actually showed us that more than anything. Um, for, you know, uh, maybe I'll do a video on it, but for instance, after 
Boss of Blades won the tournament, I started just testing, putting Yaks straight up in my Sarah deck. And uh, I don't have a ton of data, but what I will say is, honestly, it feels pretty good. Um, and I ran Moreland Haunt, too, instead of the Life Gain land. So there's still plenty of us to learn about this game, even without any updates or new cards. There's still just interactions and things we, you know, we just haven't explored yet, because there really are a lot of things that you can do between 20... Is it 22 Planeswalkers? Yeah. So anyway, this is my kind of encouraging message of like, if you're feeling kind of stale with a certain deck, um, even if you're like, oh, I'm pretty sure this is the best deck to be running, the best build to be running, maybe try tweaking it. Maybe try trying a different land, trying different cards at the top of your curve, at the bottom of your curve. Um, there's always a lot that you can tweak. I think the standouts from this build is that you get Tajik, which I think is, is just a solid card. Uh, sometimes hoses Ral when you, when you play against him. Um, and uh, Stoneforge Mystic, you just get a lot of card advantage from her, uh, which can be quite potent. Um, running to Nahira's Outburst because it's a little we're a little bit slower. We're a little bit less concerned with just peeling in it like a haste creature off the top of the deck and trying to proc our... Uh, Barbarian class, um, and then a very similar, I would say, like early game package. Um, so not a ton of difference, but enough that you probably will see your win rate change if you choose to play one build over the other. Um, and like I said, I think the Path of Barbarian, it's more linear, it's more punishing, I would say, to slower decks, um, but also can be awkward when you're playing against aggro. So sometimes if you want to just go more of a mid-range build, then I think Nona's build is potentially the way to go. Um, and I'll be sure to link all these in the description just so they're easy to add into your collection. So that is, that's Nehiri in a nutshell. Uh, just kind of some of my thoughts on why she's always been a just a really, really solid aggro option, but that there are other ways to build her. And definitely couldn't really talk about aggro without talking about Chandra. Um, and although I think we feel pretty solidified on these two splashes for Chandra, um, in the past I've sometimes seen blue splash, I've seen red splash. Um, I do think it's interesting to kind of explore these, especially when we feel like we're really sure we know what we're doing. But I, I do want to go over her just in case uh, folks who are like new um, may not have seen you know, my splash back black build that I worked on for quite a while. Um, or the what I call the Logan Classic, which is just red green Chandra, um, and and very I would say like newer player friendly. So why don't we start there, um, Chandra? What do you need to be doing with her? Obviously, you're dealing five damage at the start of the game, and you're just trying to close out with an aggressive play style. Um, I've really liked Ember Spawn Crags. It's just giving you more bodies to throw, you know, at your opponent and to deal more damage, uh, and tends to be just one of the better lands to be playing. And you'll see there are a lot of shared cards with Nahiri, right? You've got Raging Goblin, T uh, the Lemur, Overgrown Iguana, Sword Cannoneer, Short Cutter, right? All of these things, just your red aggressive plan. Um, and then you've got, you know, some of her signature cards, uh, Chandra's Firecrafter, fl uh, Flame Shot, which has always been a really powerful signature card of hers. And then some kind of like later scale, um, later game scaling cards, you know, Lava Axe to close out the game. Fire Spout Elemental as like just a big haste threat uh, that they have to deal with. And you don't really care about the two damage to yourself either. Um, and so this is just a very budget friendly, easy to build, easy to pilot aggro deck. And it can be very punishing. Uh, some of the draws can be really, really hard to deal with if your opponent, you know, is walking into a flame shot uh, that you're able to set up or they're not predicting that maybe you've got that looting lizard. Uh, to keep yourself in the game in the late game by drawing those cards or maybe they're not prepared for a vicious mongrel you know coming out um and not being you know and being able to trade past a 4-4 so you know there there are a lot of advantages you get running this deck you'll def you can hit mythic with the stack 100 um even if you shift some of the cards it's just a the old tried and true um and then you splash green for four cards which is two colonian tusker Two mana, four, three, just big stat stick. Same thing with Vicious Mongrel, and it's got haste. So you're just constantly applying pressure. But I think, since we just talked about Nahiri, Nahiri's version of this 
to me, is better. I think that her hyper-aggressive, haste-centric, you know, deck is just a bit more powerful because she has access to evasive threats and to creatures that have armor and to a lot more creatures that have haste that are able to attack, like I said, evasive with, with flying. Um, whereas like, you know, fire elemental, eh, it's fine. Like it'll maybe, you know, in an ideal world, it's doing five damage to your opponent, but most of the time that's not happening. Um, Chandra's firecrafter. I used to play, I, I think I played one of in the other build. It's, it's fine. You know, there's nothing to write home about. Flame shot is, is a really powerful signature card, but uh, I just find that, uh, Chandra can get outclassed by some of the mid-range decks but this is still a very good standard stock build aggressive deck and you'll definitely you'll hit mythic you can climb with it um you may you may want to change it to the build we're going to talk about um if you hit a wall uh just to try something different so i i really for a while wanted to try black splash i just felt like it offered something that that chandra was missing um and so you'll see like a lot of the core lower cost, you know, early curve cards, nothing different. We've got Lava Axe, we've got Flame Shot, you know, okay, what's the change? Couple different things. You're, you're running Takedown, which is just one of the best early game removal spells. And uh, when I was working on this deck, we were in a really heavy Nissa meta. And so Takedown just kills their Jiraga Druid when they play it, right? It's easy to kill. And yes, you've got Flame shot that can also kill a Draga Druid, but that costs four mana and takedown costs two. So um, I just, and, and I think takedown hits some really, really relevant creatures uh, for two mana. You also get Rage Runner, which, as I explained in my deep dive Chandra video, best of both worlds. They don't have a blocker, or they don't have, or you want to trade for one of their creatures, make it 3 1 in haste. Okay, you're not trading, it would just die, give it sneak. Right? And it, you just get a lot out of this two drop. Um, and I always wanted to play it with Chandra. And the same with Yanoku, right? Whether it's you've got, uh, you're playing the long game, you've got two or three Ember Spawn Crags in your hand, you just get to slam them, make a huge Yanoku that they have to deal with. Um, and sometimes you just run them out in the early game. Maybe he eats like a, a Pouncing Lemur that can't attack past something. You make him a 4 4, or he eats that and something else. Um, it's just, Yanogu is just a really, really great threat that, uh, for a while, I think people were, <laughs> got really used to green. Um, and then once you play it to this, you realize, wow, there's, there's a lot more heft to playing a 6-6-8-8 Yanogu, um, coming out of a Chandra deck that's already, like, pounding my life total. Um, and then I also really wanted to try Gitu Archer, and I was pretty happy with it. Um, the one damage on the body actually does quite a lot to set up uh, Flame Shot or Shock. Um, and also you could just hit their face with it, right? So it's uh, it's pretty nice. And uh, generally you're just playing it, it's trading for something, and then maybe it kills one of their evasive uh, their threats. And it's good into aggro. So I, I kind of did like it for like uh, beating up on Nahiri a little bit because I felt like that was pretty popular. And then I made some specific card choices for the late game of like one Chandra's Firecrafter for a little bit of card advantage, both looting lizards for card advantage. You're usually playing this on turn six or seven to refill and just try and close out the game. And then just Lava Axe. Um, and I really like this choice over, um, what is it? Uh, oh my God, the devil. The 4-3 the that has haste and it deals one damage for each creature. Uh, Hell Rider. There we go. It was in my brain. It just took took a minute. Um, because, you know, there's unless they're playing Negate, you're just hitting them for five. So I would say if you played a lot of Chandra Green Splash, I would give Chandra Black Splash a try. Um, and I generally found this deck to be just a really, really good, aggressive option. So that is Chandra. And now when we go to Angrath, I would put kind of like a bit of a caveat here to say that um, Angrath, I think, has been somewhat underwhelming for a while, um, and I think there's still work to be done to smooth out some of these builds, and we'll go over two of them. Um, but I do think he has a lot of potential. You can hit Mythic with him. You can honestly hit Mythic with most Planeswalkers, quite frankly. 
Um, but I do think that he is still a pretty solid like B tier aggro option. Um, so why is that, right? Like what enables him to do well? He can use them respawn crags perfectly fine, right? You've got Yanogu in here. Uh, you get to play Rage Runner. You get to play Takedown. So there's a lot of attraction for me to play Angrath because I think Black does give you um, some really interesting ways of interacting um, and just some really efficient creatures in this five, uh, you know, Rakdos package, which is two Takedown, two Rage Runner, one Yanogu. Um, but also, as Angrath does, he gets to take advantage of his passive, right, to buff his um, sneak creatures. So you've got the Silent Prowler, uh, you've got Dagger Claw Imp is just an invasive creature, but I was also, also trying to join the family, Storm, uh, the Stromkirk Mentor, and Zozu. And sometimes with Angrath, you just curve out into all of your sneak creatures and your evasive creatures, and you just beat your opponent down and there's nothing they can do. Um... I think Angrath is a little less resilient than Nahiri and Chandra in some ways, but in other ways, I think he has better matchups. So it, it really depends. And I've always liked Stromkirk Mentor because most of the time he's going to come into play as a 5 3, right? Because you're going to get the, the damage uh, passive ability uh, from Angrath. And then you're just giving something hope, like whether it's Death Raider, or potentially Yinoku. Zozu, you know, like you could, you could just in the late game really, uh, you know, give some threats that they are going to have to deal with, um, uh, you know, sneak. And also if they have haste, there's nothing they can do about it. <laughs> so that's really tough to deal with. Um, and I think that, you know, you've got Dark Confidant for a little bit of card advantage. Um, Cranium Consultant's like pretty annoying for most people to deal with. Dagger Claw Imp can honestly just win a game if they don't address it early. Um, and Flagrant Fell, I think I just have really enjoyed in a Garrick meta. Like, you just, you need answers to Death Shadow, you need answers to big, beefy creatures. Um, so I think having some hard removal, aside from the takedown, is, is a really good option. So, this is what I would say is more of like a stock, uh, Angrath build. Um, and I think whether you, you know, if you switch out some cards, I don't know that you need to play Join the Family. I was generally pretty happy with it, um, but there are plenty of other cards you can play. I think that you'll find you'll do pretty well with this. However, I've always really wanted to try Angrath with Path of the Barbarian. Why? Because we've got access to sneak creatures, we've got removal, um, we've got evasive creatures, and because of his passive, right, giving everything plus one, plus oh, it's, it's not so dissimilar from what Nahiri does and so I was like, okay, I think this is worth a shot. Um, and I think it's it's a little less polished, I would say, than how Nahiri kind of plays this out. Um, but there are a couple of interesting cards in the build that, that I thought were worth looking at. Um, so a lot of the early game package, not too different. But you'll see Untamed Rage, right? Plus three, plus so, and Trample. And although this can be awkward sometimes when you're curving out, when you pair it with a card like Two-Headed Hellhound, <laughs> <laughs> which is smacking your opponent for eight um, just with the Untamed Rage, uh, it can get pretty scary. And also it helps you proc Indomitable Strength for your smaller creatures. Um, I also think it's fine to have Path of the Barbarian because you get the Axe of Vengeance, which synergizes with this card, Nail Drop Ramp. Now, I'm not 100% sold on this card, um, but I think what's cool about it is after you activate an artifact, which can be your axe the, of Mindless Rage, uh, you drain your opponent for one. And draining is really nice in aggressive matchups, but what does it also do? It means that on a turn where you don't have uh, Searing Chains or you haven't connected for damage, that still Nail Dropper Imp will proc your passive ability. Um, it's also an evasive threat. And yes, it's three mana for a 2-2 flyer, which is a little less impactful, certainly, than a card like Sky Knight Legionnaire, I actually think it has like a cool role to play in the deck. It also is doing double damage on Searing Chains. Um, and I think that you often can get your opponent pretty low where you just need some non, you know, uh, blockable damage to close out the game. So I thought that that was kind of a cool iteration to the deck. Um, and then you've kind of got the Sneak Package. You've also got Fire Spell Elemental, obviously synergizes well with Indomitable Strength because 
It's a 6-6 six, six attacking, so it's going to proc that 5 damage to their face. Um, I found this to be maybe a little bit less consistent, but at times more powerful. Um, because Path of the Barbarian can really just do chunks and chunks of damage, especially when you have evasive creatures like Dagger Claw Imp or with sneak creatures like Stormkirk Mentor, Mentor and Silent Prowler. It just makes a deck that has a lot of damage that's not preventable. Um, and that's kind of why we've got this angry Angrath Barbarian uh, class card, because I thought it was, it still works. Um, and I, I tried it with Chandra, it just, I think Chandra's, although there's some of the core cards are there, I just didn't think it made as much sense synergizing with her. I think it makes more sense because both Angrath and Nahiri buff creatures power and enables Path of Barbarian a lot more easily. So that's what I got for you today. Uh, this actually felt pretty quick because we're just talking about the decks. Um, so let me know what you think of this kind of series of doing a little bit of like a quick kind of dive on some of the decks that I've obviously definitely spent some time with um, and thought about and iterated on. Um, whether you're a new player or old player, I'd love to hear what you guys are still really interested in seeing since I'm doing, you know, one video of Spellslingers a week. Um, so other than that, I'm going to get ready to work on a control one for next week, but also we'll have all the content from the f uh, fourth Mythic League tournament. Um, so again, you know, uh, don't miss that sign up. We'd love to see you there. Um, and yeah, I think that's about it for today. So check back later in the week. We'll have a deep dive on some of the best control decks in the format. And uh, as always, thanks for sticking with me and I'll catch you next time.